Welcome. I am your host, Dr. Derek A. Reeves, and this is our daily Bible study. We're still studying the topic undertaking, uh, excuse me, understanding the soul. And we are now on segment five, the mind direct, uh, dissected. So let's dive right into our scripture, Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. As we mentioned earlier, when we deal with the term that deals with soul, it's very interesting because it reveals the term nefesh. And when we look at the term nefesh, it brings to us an understanding of something that is totally unique from the Hebrew concept. And so the term soul or living soul, which is the word kahi nefesh, some call it nepesh. And when we deal with this term living soul, and I'm looking here on the screen, I just don't want you to think that I'm looking off into space somewhere. But when we look at the term, man became a living soul, we have to understand the ramifications of this. This term is very expressive and very important because not only does it deal with a living creature, but it also deals with something that is breathing. And so the evidence of the soul is its breathing capacity. And also this definition can mean the mind, the appetites. And when we talk about appetites, we're talking about the instinctual appetites that drive someone to desire or to fulfill instinctive needs. And so when we speak of these appetites, they can be emotional appetites, they can be physiological, the appetite for food, uh, the appetite or desire for relationship. It can even deal with sexual appetites and even those appetites that take the volition into an arena where it desires the supernatural. But specifically, we're dealing with the mind, the mind. And so the soul then is equivalent to the mind of the individual, the mental aspect of the individual that causes them to take information from the sensory mechanisms of the body. Again, the five senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. These are the primary methodologies in which man learns natural knowledge. His sight enables him to see and to gain the visual perspective, whereas his physiology enables him to touch, to gain a sensory connection with those things around him. Taste, again, he is enabled or empowered to um, experience foods and nectars and specific things of that nature. And so the five senses bring to him the capacity where he is capable of experiencing the world and interpreting the world. Uh, later on, I'm going to teach something from philosophy, philosophical hermeneutics. Many people don't understand that hermeneutics is a part of philosophy. And for the most part, people consider textual hermeneutics. Textual hermeneutics enables the person to interpret text, the meaning, the purpose, the reasoning behind the communication of the original writer, thinker, speaker. But hermeneutics also is interpretation of reality or the context of life and those things that uh, are expressed in life. If life is a script, then life itself can be interpreted. And so the mind of man, when we consider this, the mind then has to be considered in its um, construction, the totality, or understanding how the mind can be literally brought into an aspect of being dissected. 
And I'm choosing my words carefully because, of course, we don't understand whether or not the mind can be dissected. And I'm not speaking of the brain, but I'm speaking of the immaterial entity or the soul itself. We know it has exertions. We know it has abilities, capabilities, such as in uh, intelligence, the ability to emotivize or emotion, the volition or the capacity to desire or to have a will or to choose. And so when we speak of the dissecting of the mind, we're simply talking about a methodology of analyzing, examining it to analyze its capacities, its powers, its persuasions, its nature, and the very dynamics of the mind. Now, as we said in the last study, the mind then is the individual within his or her individuality. Individuality is a personal reference of the person as a singular person with all of his hang-ups, desires, and all of the instinctual urges within the mind. And so the mind is, again, the living soul. A living soul is a soul that is active in doing what a mind does. And that deals with the thought processes of the intellect, the thought processes of emotion, the thought processes of even the volition. And so the mind, again, individualization, the mind also has the capacity of being conscious. Consciousness means that you are pertinently awake or aroused to the point where your perception can now perceive, you can discern, you know, you experience the reality and the thoughts in your mind are connecting you to understand what is. And so you are awake to things. And then when we talk about the awareness, consciousness and awareness work together. Consciousness means you are capable of perceiving. Awareness, you understand or you know what it is you are conscious to or perceiving. And then we talked about the intellect, which is the capacity to analyze, to use logic, to use critical thinking, to solve problems. Emotion, the emotive process then, the emotions ex movir, ex movere, moving out. Emotions are those feelings and those responses that move you to action, to think, to choose. And so emotions are reactions, they are responses to any type of stimuli, any type of activity or action or conversation or communication. And then you have, again, intellect, emotion, and the volition. The volition is the aspect of the mind in choice or desiring. One such term that brings us to this is thelema, which is the will, the mind, in doing what it desires to do after it has chosen. And so when we break these down, Every aspect, the intellect, the emotion, and the volition, the thought process, the feelings of the emotion, and the choice or the will, each of these can be tempered within what we call levels of consciousness. The levels of consciousness are, of course, active consciousness, the subconscious, which is just below the active conscious. The active conscious is generally the servant or the revealer of the unconscious. When things are in the unconscious mind and we are thinking these things, no matter what experience goes on within our mind, we are at time expressing what we subconsciously feel about it or think about it because the subconscious is the revealer of the unconscious and the revealer of what you're really thinking. You don't always speak it, but there are times that physical or body reactions 
what we call nonverbal communication will reveal either your disgust, your pleasure, your desire, your being stimulated by something. And so there is the, again, conscious, subconscious, unconscious aspects of the mind. Most of the mind is in the unconscious, and most of the mind that drives behavior is in the unconscious. And so the unconscious then allows the subconscious to reveal, to experience, and to really respond, while the conscious mind is the aspect of the individual that considers reactions. What will happen if I do this publicly? And so the conscious mind is the filter. He, she, it permits specific thoughts to come forth that they may be recycled, turned into information, turned into patterns, turned into behaviors. We're out of time. I'm your host, Dr. Derek A. Reeves, and this has been our daily Bible study, and we're currently studying Understanding the Soul, and this segment has been entitled The Mind Dissected. Until next time, God bless you. Jesus is coming back again, and every eye shall see him.